Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk at the Cambridge Festival. I'm Simon Baron Cohen, and I'm the director of the Autism Research Centre here at Cambridge University. And today I'm talking to you about my new book, The Pattern Seekers. And this book addresses a big question. Is there a link between autism and invention? Uh, on the face of things, one wouldn't expect a link be between these two things. Uh, autism, uh, a disability, and invention, as I'll go on to argue, one of the defining characteristics of Homo sapiens. But is there a link? Well, let's start with invention and thinking about when in evolutionary time do we see the first signs of invention? Well, we can go back to earlier species of Homo, such as Homo habilis, living over two million years ago, to certainly see evidence of the use of stone tools. This was a species of, of Homo, our ancestors, who were making stone tools. Um, and the question is really, was this an invention? My notion of invention is that you don't just come up with something new once, but that you have the capacity to invent over and over again. I call it generative invention. And th at least this species of our ancestors tended to just use the same design in their stone axes, like a hammer to crack a nut or an ax to cut and scrape, but pretty much the same design for uh, most of their existence. Equally, when we look at another of our ancestors, Homo erectus, we can see a change in their design of their stone tools. They were around from over 2 million years ago too. Uh, but again, no real sign of generative invention coming up with multiple types of inventions. And finally, um, just looking at ancestors, the Neanderthals who, who lived about 300,000 years ago to as recently as 40,000 years ago. Again, we can see that they were using a different design in their stone tools. Uh, but I think all of these are simple uh, tools and I'll talk about why uh, I call them simple. Uh, and again, very little sign of generative invention. They were doing one or two interesting things and there may be a lively debate amongst archeologists as to whether they could invent. But I'm gonna argue, we don't see the flowering of invention uh, until um, Homo sapiens is on the scene. In addition, when we look at sort of living non-human animals today, we see that they too are capable of using simple stone tools. Here's a chimpanzee using a rock as a hammer to crack a nut. Uh, and even outside of the primates, if we look at this crow, for example, under experimental conditions, the crow is dropping a stone into the water to raise the level of, of the water so that the crow can get the juicy bait. So it looks like intelligent behavior. Uh, and I think that a lot of this use of uh, tools, simple tools, whether it's in our early ancestor, ancestors or among non-human animals alive today can be explained by what psychologists call associative learning. Learning the association between an action and um, an outcome, um, but where there's, uh, especially when that outcome is rewarding, but where it lacks the complexity that we see in Homo sapiens, modern human invention. So I argue that between about 70,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago, something dramatic changed in the human brain. I call it the cognitive revolution. Um, and I'm gonna be arguing actually for the development of two new systems in the brain uh, that characterizes modern homo sapiens or modern humans and which enabled invention. The first of these big changes I call the systemizing mechanism. So this was a new circuit in the brain that looked for patterns in the world, hence the title of my book, The Pattern Seekers, but not just any old patterns. We can see that 
our ancestors could see patterns between A and B, so-called you know, association learning, and so, could, so can living non-human animals today. But rather what changed in modern humans was we were looking for very special kinds of patterns, which I call if and then patterns. And I'm gonna really kind of focus on these three little words because they're so important to understanding why our world is full of invention and how we've transformed our world. So when we look for these if and then patterns, we don't just look to find them, we then repeat our observations or our experiments to confirm the pattern, to see if they hold true. And then we start to play with the pattern where we can change the if or change the and to see what happens next. And you can see a picture here of the logician, George Boole, whose analysis I'm leaning on quite heavily because he saw if and then patterns as the basis of logical thought. If you talk to engineers, they use three different words to uh, define a system. They talk about input, operation, and output, but these map on pretty, uh, uh, pretty exactly to what I'm calling if and then. So you take an input, you perform an operation on that input to see how it changes in the output. Uh, and then you go round and round in this feedback loop to confirm if the pattern holds true or to see what happens if you change the input or change the operation, what do you, what do you get that's new? And this pattern, the if and then pattern, at a minimum defines what we mean by a system. Hence, uh, this new circuit in the brain is called the systemizing mechanism. Suddenly humans, modern humans, um, for the first time, were looking at the world as a, as a series of systems. So what do we see in the archeological record that suddenly justifies this, um, what I'm calling this cognitive revolution? So now we're seeing complex tools like the bow and arrow. And if we look at the analysis of what it takes to build a bow and arrow, we can see the if and then logic. If I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and I release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. Notice here that the and is actually a causal operation, that you're doing something to the input to cause it to, to change. That's what you see in the output. But what else do we see that's really remarkable in the, uh, in the archeological record from around this time? Well, we see the first jewelry, which is this necklace. Um, and if you think back to the simple stone tools that I showed you from our ancestors, I hope you'll agree that this is a, a difference in complexity that again, we would see the same logic underlying the invention of the first jewelry, that if I take these shells and I drill holes in them and thread a thread through the holes, then I can make a necklace. Not long after that, 40,000 years ago, we see the invention of the first musical instrument, this bone flute made from the hollow bone of a bird. And if we look at the if and then logic that I think was required to come up with this invention, we have to put ourselves into the shoes of the maker, the inventor 40,000 years ago, who might've been thinking, if I blow down this hollow bone and I cover one hole, then I make a particular sound. And then they could play, for example, with the and variable in this little algorithm. If I blow down this hollow bone and uncover one hole, then I make a different sound. And suddenly what we see is not only the invention of a new tool, a musical instrument, but the invention of a new system, which is music. And we all know that um, from around that time, we also see remarkable other inventions like cave painting, uh, the first sculpture 25,000 years ago in this case, uh, sewing needles from 23,000 years ago, uh, 
And we can identify that same algorithm, the if and then logic in all of the major revolutions in terms of invention that humans have been through. So if we think about the invention of agriculture, you can see those same three words. If I take a tomato seed and plant it in moist soil, that's the causal bit, then I get a tomato plant. Or in, in the case of the invention of mathematics, um, if I take the number three and I cube it, that's the operation or the causal bit, then I get the number 27. And the thing about these if and then rules or patterns is that in the best case, they always hold true. So you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it like our best scientists or our best engineers are doing or our best mathematicians to confirm that the pattern holds true, not just once, but in a timeless way. And that's the kind of beauty of these patterns. And if we come down to earth and think not about the invention of technology or the invention of mathematics, but just the invention of new ways of doing things like cooking, again, you can see that same algorithm at work. If I take an egg and put it in boiling water for four minutes, then the yolk will turn from soft yellow to hard yellow. And you can just uh, pause to think about the change that the invention of cooking would have meant for our ancestors, not just in terms of diet, but in terms of health uh, and opportunities. But let's go back to the first piece of jewellery, because although this systemizing mechanism could explain um, how we were able to make it through this if and then logic, the reason why I think the cognitive revolution involved a second circuit is because the maker of the jewellery might also have been thinking, if I wear this jewellery, how am I perceived by others? Or if I give this jewellery as a, as a gift to someone, will he or she appreciate it? Will they enjoy it? So whilst the systemizing mechanism could help us understand how they could make it, it may not explain why they were making it. And for that reason, we need to also think about a second circuit, which I call the empathy circuit. I think the existence of jewellery in the archaeological record suggests that the capacity for empathy was also there um, around 70 to 100,000 years ago. The same is true if you think about it in relation to the first musical instrument. The systemizing mechanism may explain how we could make the instrument, but it doesn't really explain that the maker might have been wanting to communicate, wanting to communicate their feelings, or might have been curious as to how the listener might appreciate the music that they were making. So the empathy circuit allows for this self-reflection on one's own thoughts and feelings, but also reflecting on the thoughts and feelings of others. And empathy seems to have at least two components, cognitive empathy, sometimes called theory of mind, being able to imagine another person's thoughts and feelings, and then affective empathy, which is having an emotional response to somebody else's thoughts and feelings. So the empathy circuit, I think, opened the way for modern humans to engage in a new way of relating to each other suddenly we could engage in, uh, in deception, in thinking about the thoughts and intentions of each other, uh, what another person might know, think, believe, or want, and a new level of complexity of social interaction that we don't see in other species. This just shows you some of the new behaviors that would have um, been enabled by the existence of the capacity for empathy, this new circuit in the brain. Deception, so being able to plant a false belief into the mind of another person or animal, uh, which they might hold to be true. Teaching, so what does somebody else need to know in order to understand something? Uh, referential communication, whether you're using words or symbols or gestures, um, intending your listener to recognize that the symbol uh, refers to something in the outside world and new forms of complex social communication, 
So I've laid out, you know, that I think uh, around 70 to 100,000 years ago, two new systems evolved in the human brain, the systemizing mechanism, enabling invention, discovery, and control over the world through pattern recognition, and the empathy circuit, enabling a whole raft of new behaviors to do with communication um, and social interaction. Let's get back to our big question in this talk and in my book. Is there a link between autism and the capacity for invention? So what we know about autism is that despite their social difficulties, their difficulties in communication, they love patterns. This is 10 year old Max Park, who became obsessed with the Rubik cube, which is nothing more than a system of patterns. And by the age of 10, he had become ranked in the top 100 Rubik cube speed cubers in competitions in the world. And today he's actually ranked as number one. He's an adult now. So despite his disability in socializing and in communication, he's actually not just showing strengths in pattern recognition, but, uh, but talent. This is Derek Paravicini, um, and he's also autistic, like Max. Uh, Derek also has uh, learning difficulties, so he's got the mental age of a three-year-old, and he's congenitally blind. Despite all that, he loves patterns, and in his case, because of his blindness, they're auditory patterns. And he can listen to any jazz song just once and reproduce it perfectly. And then if you ask him to transpose it into a new key, he can do that in lightning time. So he's recognizing patterns and playing with patterns in the auditory domain. And here's Daniel Tammet. Um, he's a writer, some of you may know his work. Um, describing his experiences. He's autistic uh, and he came to fame because he memorized the number pi to over 22,000 decimal places. Most of us know it to five or six decimal places, but Daniel obsessively, some people might say, memorized the patterns in this very long number. So he was fascinated by numerical patterns. Anecdotes aside, because these are just uh, autistic individuals with their personal stories, science is all about um, what can we learn from data from large numbers of people. And we gave this test to groups of autistic children and, uh, and children without autism. So it's a little mechanical reasoning test where you look at this novel system where the wheel rotates anti-clockwise and you're asked to say what will happen to that point P. And the correct answer in this little multiple choice test is, is C, that it will move back and forth. Autistic children scored above average on this test of understanding a, a system that they'd never seen before compared to children without autism. So despite their disability, they're showing a talent at understanding a system. Autistic people also do very well on tests of pattern recognition. So in this test, you're asked to find the cube as quickly as you can in the overall image um, at the top of the screen. If I had a pointer, I would help you trace it out, but some of you may already be able to see the hidden cube in there. Autistic people are super fast and super accurate at this pattern recognition. So just um, recently we conducted something called the UK Brain Types Study to try and understand the relationships between systemizing empathy and autism. In this study, uh, over 600,000 people took part, both from the typical population, but also from the autism community. Indeed, 36,000 autistic people took part. It was an online study. And each person completed three brief questionnaires, the EQ to measure their empathy, the SQ to measure their interest in systems, and then the AQ to measure how many autistic traits they had. 
And this is what we found, that first of all, on each of these measures, there was a bell curve in the population. So on the empathy quotient, we could see that most people scored average. They were in the middle of the bell curve, but some people were above average and some were below average. So in the big graph here, you can see the kind of schematic of the bell curve. And uh, in the small graph, you can see our actual data also reflecting a sex difference in the general population, that on average, females scored higher than males in terms of empathy. We also found that bell curve when it came to systemizing, how interested are you in systems of one kind or another, whether it's mechanical systems like a computer, natural systems like the weather, or abstract systems like mathematics. Um, again, individual differences on this, and uh, the small graph shows you in our actual data that uh, there was another gender difference, this time uh, males on average scoring slightly higher than females. But here was the link with between systemizing and autism. What we found was that if you took the 600,000 people and divided them into whether they worked in STEM or not, so science, technology, engineering, or maths, compared to those who didn't work in STEM, the people in the STEM group had a higher number of autistic traits. So that was the first surprise, really. Um, why should it be that just because you have an aptitude in uh, systemizing, um, in if and then pattern recognition, that you should also have more autistic traits? Back to a few anecdotes. If we look at you know, famous inventors from history, this is Thomas Edison, uh, who famously invented the light bulb, was in fact invented unstoppably um, with hundreds of patents uh, for different inventions. Uh, his biography suggests that he probably had a lot of autistic traits. As a child, he wasn't coping in mainstream school, so his mother homeschooled him. As a teenager, he became obsessed with Morse code and actually earned a living. There you can see him as a teenager in that small photo, um, working as a telegraph operator. Um, he became so obsessed with Morse code that actually when he had a family, he named his first two children Dot and Dash. And uh, being an unstoppable inventor, always experimenting with patterns, his wife moved a mattress into his workshop because he'd be experimenting all day and all night so he could sleep there. And these two uh, scientists, Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, clearly giants in the field of physics, uh, but also have been described as having many autistic traits. Isaac Newton, um, who worked here in Cambridge, um, had a difficult personality, often got into conflict with, with other people. Um, and allegedly continued giving his lectures to an empty lecture theatre long after the students had given up attending because it was in his job contract. Uh, Albert Einstein was apparently very delayed in language, didn't talk until he was five years old, and said of himself that he didn't really want to spend time socialising because he much preferred just being immersed in his work. But again, anecdotes don't really um, tell us very much about this link between autism and invention. They give us clues. And this link might not be limited to men and women of, of science, because if we think about the musician Glenn Gould, again, many people have speculated that he might have today needed a diagnosis of autism or certainly had a lot of autistic traits. Um, he was quite inflexible in his behavior, always went to the same cafe every night at the same time and sat at the same table and ordered the exact same food. Uh, so he loved routine like autistic people and needed to have his own personal chair uh, wherever he went to perform. Even if he was traveling around the world, he had to have a, a particular chair that was at the same height and the same angle to the keyboard. Uh, but Anecdotes, particularly about historical figures who are no longer living, are not a reliable way to draw any conclusions. 
the biographical record may be incomplete. And some people might argue that kind of historical diagnosis is a bit unfair because the person isn't here to speak up for themselves. But instead, what we can do is look at big data. So in that UK brain types data, what did we find? Well, we found that you can categorize everybody in the population into one of five different brain types. So in light blue are people whose empathy is at a higher level than their systemizing. In light pink are people whose systemizing is at a higher level than their empathy. So each of those constitutes about 30% of the population. In the white region of this um, space are people we call type B for balanced. Uh, and again, they are about 30% of the population and their empathy is at a similar level to their systemizing. So they don't show a, a discrepancy. And then we have the extremes of the population. In the dark blue are people who are an extreme of type E for empathizers. Uh, they are empathizing nonstop. They're always thinking about what other people are thinking and feeling. Um, but their systemizing may be average or even below average. And then in the dark red area is the final brain type, an extreme of the systemizing brain. Um, these are people who look for patterns nonstop, probably like Edison. Um, they're constantly searching the environment for patterns and spotting what is consistent or inconsistent and playing with the patterns to see if they can come up with something new. And this is where we find uh, the majority of autistic people in that big study fell. They were either type S, the systemizers, or extreme type S, way up at the extreme of that bell curve in terms of um, their systemizing, whilst their empathy might be just average or even below average. So that gave us another clue for the link between autism and systemizing, which I argue underlies invention. Then we went one step further in our research, which was to ask people who were taking the questionnaires to give us a saliva sample so we could look at their DNA. And this was in order to answer the question, does empathy and does systemizing have a partly genetic basis? And indeed, does the kind of brain type that you end up with, which is a profile reflecting the difference between your empathy and your systemizing, whether you're more biased towards the world of people and empathizing or more biased towards the world of objects and patterns, uh, more of a systemizer. What we found was that indeed common genetic variants were associated with where you score on the empathy bell curve and the systemizing bell curve. We were able to do this by working with the company 23andMe because the people who'd taken these tests um, were also customers of this personal genomics company where they could take questionnaires on the website as well as providing DNA samples for analysis. Here was the kind of big uh, clue that we were looking for, because when we looked at the common genetic variants, genes that we all carry, but in certain combinations, that were associated with scoring high in systemizing, these overlapped with the common genetic variants that we find autistic people also carry. So to put that in another way, the genes that code for autism also overlap with the genes that code for aptitude in systemizing or if and then pattern recognition, uh, which I argue underlies the capacity for invention. That genetic link comes out in family studies that if we look at the fathers and indeed the grandfathers of autistic children, they're disproportionately more likely to be working in the field of engineering. Engineering, of course, is an occupation where you need to be good at understanding systems and patterns and spotting these repeating regularities. Um, and these fathers and grandfathers are more likely to have a child with autism. So pointing at a, a genetic basis. And that led us to carry out what we call the Silicon Valley study. If it's the case that people who are good at inventing, good at systemizing, 
uh, good at this if and then logical systems thinking um, are more likely to uh, uh, to carry the genes for a child to go on to develop autism, then we should find higher rates of autism in places like Silicon Valley. Well, Silicon Valley is a long way away from Cambridge, England. So we went to a Silicon Valley a bit closer to home in the Netherlands, uh, in particular looking at the city of Eindhoven. Eindhoven is a kind of IT hub. A third of the jobs in Eindhoven are in IT. And Eindhoven has also been uh, the home to the Philips factory for over 100 years, attracting people who are good at technology and home to the Eindhoven Institute of Technology, which is a bit like MIT. So it's been a magnet for people with an aptitude in systems thinking. And we compared autism rates there to two other Dutch cities, Utrecht and Haarlem, that were matched for similar size and other demographics. And what you can see here is that the autism rates were more than twice as high in Eindhoven compared to the other two cities. So confirming um, a likely genetic link between aptitude at invention or systems thinking and likelihood of autism in the family. So in closing, I want to think about um, the position of autistic people in our society today, because if you have followed my arguments about how autistic people um, are not only overrepresented um, amongst people who think systematically and logically today, but for genetic reasons were always so, stretching back to the beginnings of invention 70 to 100,000 years ago, then they've played a really important role in the evolution of human progress. And yet, when we look at autistic people in the 21st century, what do we find? We find a lot of autistic kids have dropped out of school because they have not enjoyed high school. They've dropped out of school without formal qualifications, underachieving despite their intelligence. The majority of autistic adults are unemployed. The National Autistic Society suggests it may be as high as 85% unemployment. Again, despite their good intelligence in many, many individuals, um, they're not finding work. And we could imagine all kinds of barriers as to why that should be the case. It could be that because they don't have the formal qualifications of GCSEs or A-levels in many cases, that's the reason. It could be that even if they've got those qualifications, they're not getting through the selection process, which usually focuses on social skills and communication at an interview, such as eye contact and being able to uh, read between the lines in terms of what people are saying. And these are exactly the areas of disability in autism. So for many reasons, we might imagine that autistic people are being discriminated against on the basis of their disability. This um, slide shows you um, a company called Auticon. Uh, I'm a, an advisor to the company. Auticon stands for Autistic Consultants. They only hire autistic people and they place them in companies where they might need people with good pattern recognition skills, good pattern seekers. Um, and they do this because they know that it might be good for the company um, who want to make profits, but good for the autistic person because unemployment is really not good for your mental health. The majority of autistic adults have anxiety and depression, uh, probably as a result of feeling that sense of exclusion from society, uh, that sense of not being valued by society, not belonging to society. Um, and supported employment projects of this kind or employment projects where the employer has the uh, vision of making reasonable adjustments to accommodate the person's disability, to give them a chance to prove themselves, I think is, uh, is really important. I'm gonna finish with an image that comes from the autism community. Um, and it's, I think, a very important concept. 
Uh, it talks about neurodiversity. This is a word that we're increasingly hearing about. Uh, it obviously relates to the much older concept of biodiversity. We're aware of the many different ways that you can be an animal or a plant. Um, and we're aware of other forms of, um, of diversity that we're trying to um, really ensure um, equal opportunities for, such as gender diversity or ethnic diversity in schools and in the workplace. But neurodiversity is kind of late and a late arrival in this effort to try and improve society for the benefit of, of individuals. Neurodiversity really refers to the idea that there isn't a single way for the brain to develop, that the brain can develop in multiple different ways. We saw that in the big brain type study where there are at least five different profiles, five different brain types in the population. And autism uh, may be just one example of a different type of brain. Um, what we saw amongst the different profiles in the population is you'd be hard pressed to say that one profile was better or worse than another. They're just different. And this is what the autism community is asking us to recognize, that autistic people are different, but they're not less. They're not inferior. They're not broken. They're not diseased or disordered, despite the language that's often used in the medical literature. Of course, there are disabilities in autism. That's why the person needs a diagnosis to get extra support. And sometimes there may be additional uh, conditions like epilepsy um, or medical conditions like gastrointestinal pain um, or additional disabilities like learning difficulties. But autism itself involves a different way of thinking, a different way of processing information. And the autism community is simply asking for respect, for dignity, and for acceptance. Thank you very much for listening.